Okay, so we're now live streaming. So um, if you again, if you want to keep your video on, um, just be aware that um, you'll be visible to people on our YouTube channel. Um, what time is it? Just from seven. I think. Um, Henry, should we should we make a start? Um, and people can still still join us um, if if they want to. Um, so can I ask everybody to mute yourself if you're not already muted, please? Um, and uh, you can then obviously unmute once we get to the question and answers uh, at the end of the session. Um, and um, if you're um, listening to us on live stream, again, if you want to contribute um, to the question and answers, um, if you type in uh, any questions you have uh, as the session goes along or at the end, um, we'll monitor that and ask those questions on your behalf. Um, and everybody in the club who's on this Zoom, um, again, um, uh, we've agreed um, that we'll take, Henry will take questions at the end. Um, and, uh, but again, if you want to type anything into the chat, which is questions, again, we'll monitor those and, and we can ask the um, questions that are on the chat as well. Um, so again, if you can all um, mute yourselves, um, that would be brilliant. Um, and so I'm, I'm just doing a bit of muting as well. Um, so um, our speaker tonight is Henry Richards. Um, I've, I've been teaching myself to say Henry Richards instead of Richard Henry, and I, I've actually got it right, so I'm very proud of myself. So, but Henry, we Richards, get that quite a lot. <laughs> I thought you might. And I just thought I must get it right. Um, oh. So. Um, Welcome to Henry and um, thank you very much indeed um, for um, agreeing to give this talk tonight and I'm sure um, people are going to be fascinated by what's happening um, with beavers in Derbyshire. Um, so Henry works for Derbyshire Wildlife Trust and he's the Living Landscape Officer covering 12 reserves in the south of the county um, and it will be Henry who's um, taking forward the project um, with the beaver reintroduction over the next four years as I understand it Henry. Um, so I, I think um, it's always best, I think, if the, the speaker does um, their own introductions as well, um, and I just shut up. Um, so Henry, if you want to share your screen, and if yep. you want to take over, um, then we would love to hear what you have to tell us. There we go. So can you all see that PowerPoint now? Yep. Well, and I it's on full screen and everything there. Yep. Brilliant. Okay, look. Um, so, hi everyone. My name's Henry. Like Rachel said, I am the Living Landscapes Officer for the Trent Valley for Derbyshire Wildlife Trust. Um, I'll explain a little bit more about what Living Landscapes Officer actually means because it, it's um, potentially not the most descriptive name for some people if you don't know what it means. So, I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, so, in the talk this evening, the main part of the talk is going to be about the Beaver Project that we've now got up and running down in the Trent Valley at Willington. Um, but before that, I'm going to do a little bit about um, the Trent Valley itself, and a bit of background at Willington and things like that as well, and talk about why we want to do the project. Um, <clears throat> so, um, who are the Wildlife Trusts? Hopefully quite a lot of you will know quite a lot about Derbyshire Wildlife Trust. I don't know if, if any of you are members, um, hopefully a few, um, as you will probably have quite a, a similar interest to a lot of our members if you're not a member. Um, so the Wildlife Trusts are a national umbrella um, of multiple different individual organisations. Um, so it's a network, as it says on there, of 47 different wildlife trusts um, at county level or multiple counties, um, but sort of covering a local area. Um, there's also junior levels to that, and um, they do magazines and things like that on a national level. And then we kind of work together throughout all the different wildlife trusts on campaigns and Big projects like that and use sort of similar branding and things like that. Um, <clears throat> and Derbyshire Wildlife Trust is obviously the Derbyshire branch of, um, the, of the National Wildlife Trust. Started in 1962 as Derbyshire Naturalist Society, um, which is similar for a lot of the, the county wildlife trusts actually. Um, we are an independent separate charity to the rest of the wildlife trusts, but as I said it's kind of, um, we work together on a lot of different campaigns and branding and that kind of thing. So we tend to work similarly in a lot of ways, but we do have our own um, boards and trustees and CEOs. Um, so Derbyshire Wildlife Trust is its own individual charity. Um, 
these numbers on here were correct as of when I made this talk a few months ago, originally made this talk. Um, at that time, we had a membership of about 18,000 and about 65 staff. I think that both of those have gone up very slightly since then, um, which is really good to, to be growing sort of at times like this when there are still financial difficulties and things like that. So we're really pleased with that. Um, and we are um, <clears throat> the only charity that works across all of Derbyshire um, working on all different wildlife. There are obviously different wildlife and conservation organisations that work across national scales or on individual groups, but we're the only ones that work on um, the whole of Derbyshire and all different wildlife. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of you will probably know our work through our nature reserves. So that, this is traditionally um, what wildlife trusts, including Derbyshire Wildlife Trust, focused on um, to help with nature conservation. So a lot of the wildlife trusts, including Derbyshire, started around um, purchasing one individual patch of land that was under threat or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and this was the traditional focus for us. So we've got, uh, I think it's 40... Ooh, I can't remember now, 40 something nature reserves. Um, in fact, I can have a look at this. 48 nature reserves as of the time we're making this talk. And that does go up and down over time as well. Um, sometimes we take on new land and sometimes we um, lose some land and things like that as well. So we've got 48 nature reserves across the county and they are in all different habitats across the county as well. So as you can see from these pictures on the side, um, in the top right there, we've got some of the dark peak reserves. So some moorland, um, <clears throat> upland oak woodland places like that in the dark peak then through the white peak and the y valley and the limestone um gorges there then down through the derwent valley and the lower derwent valley where there's some um nice wooded valleys there and woodland reserves and then through erewash where we've got our uh, woodside farm there we can see the cows and then down to the trent at the bottom uh, which is where i'm based now where we have quite a lot of wetland reserves as well as some woodlands down there as well um but uh, yeah, a lot of the, the reserves down in the Trent are more wetland based than a lot of the others. <clears throat> so, as I said, traditionally, we worked on protecting nature reserves as, as core areas um, to try and protect wildlife by stopping anything bad happening to those nature reserves. But as we all know, unfortunately, that on its own hasn't worked and we are still losing a lot of wildlife. Um, so what we at Derbyshire Wildlife Trust, as well as other wildlife trusts and other nature conservation organisations across the country have moved towards now, is a, uh, what we call, there's different names for it, but what we call a living landscape approach. And what that means is basically we've kind of um, divided the county up almost into living landscape areas. Um, as I said, mine is the Trent Valley. And what that means is we have core areas which are often our nature reserves but also other people's nature reserves as well and the idea is to try and connect those up along corridors um, in the Trent Valley we have a really handy corridor in the River Trent itself um, which obviously wildlife moves along as, as you guys will know um, but also things like linear stretches of woodland or hedges and things like that can all be used to connect up different patches of really good wildlife habitat like the nature reserves so a lot of our focus although we still do obviously look after the nature reserves our focus has also moved outside that to trying to connect up those reserves to make a, a landscape that wildlife can move across. And that's going to become more and more important um, with changes in climate and things like that as well. So wildlife will likely be moving south to north um, as the climate warms and things like that. So then we've got this landscape that the wildlife can move up and, up and through. <clears throat> so that's why I'm called the Living Landscapes Officer now, rather than the older name, which was Reserves Officers. Um, so as I said, my patch is the Trent, and within that there are, I think, 11 now nature reserves. Um, and those are one of my main focuses. But within that, we also look at um, other ways of joining those up. So one of the things that we look at in terms of um, and something that's became a, become a major thing within conservation at the moment is kind of whether we can use rewilding approaches to help us with management of our reserves, which is almost a bit of an oxymoron. Um, because rewilding is more of a um, hands-off approach. But in the UK, where all of our habitats are, nearly all of our habitats are influenced by humans, it's slightly more difficult just to completely let go. So what we're, but what we're looking at is more different ways of doing things and potentially a more natural approach. 
So <clears throat> um, this is a map and an image of Willington Nature Reserve, which is one of, if not our flagship nature reserve for the Trent Valley area. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been there. Um, so I can see a couple of people on there that are shaking their heads. It's quite a way for you guys to go, obviously, from the Buxton area. Um, but really good for bird watching. Um, and on the map, on, you can see on the left there, can you see my cursor there moving around? Yep. <clears throat> so on the map, what we've got here is the red is the outline of the reserve. And then within that, we've got orange, which is grassland areas. Green is woodland. Um, the pale blue, just to make it a little bit confusing, even it looks like water is actually reed bed. And then the blue with ease on it is um, that is open water. So as you can see, quite a wetland water reed bed focused reserve. And you can see that from the photo as well, which makes it a little bit clearer than that, uh, than the blue with ease on it on the map there. <clears throat> so these are some of the species that we know we've got at the reserve or have had at times at the reserve. So things like kingfishers, um, it's, as I said, really well known for its bird life and has lots of, vis lots of visitors come for the bird life. So kingfishers, um, multiple different species of egrets, uh, we've got bitterns there regularly now, not breeding yet, but hopefully soon. Um, as, as you might know, they need big patches of, of reed bed that are quite mature, um, which we do have there now, but whether we've got quite enough of them to be breeding might be another issue. Um, but we've got them there regularly now. Things like water voles, and then it's also really good for amphibians and loads of invertebrates as well. <clears throat> so a few of the main habitats on the site, um, if we just go through some of the major ones. So as I said, lots of reed bed on site. So another picture of a bit in there. We've also got multiple species of um, warblers in there. And we've got a reed bunting flying in there from the side. And um, <clears throat> as I said, quite a major area of reed bed. One of the biggest we think in the Derbyshire area of the Trent Valley. Um, we don't know for sure because we haven't mapped it out and compared to, but we think it's one of the biggest in the, in the Trent Valley. So a really important area of reed bed habitat. Uh, lots of wet grassland as well, so the orange on the map up there, not all of that's wet grassland, but a major part of it is. Um, <clears throat> and as you can see, what we've got on there is those aren't the cows that we use anymore, but we still do graze that with cows. Um, but we graze it at very low intensity levels, with the idea, idea being that we then keep it as grassland, um, using sort of a, um, almost trying to recreate the natural processes of, of the grazes we might have had in Britain thousands of years ago, we now do that with livestock instead um, and try and use the more natural breeds of those, the more hardy breeds of those. <clears throat> so some of the species we get in there, we've got snipe, herons, um, what we've got curlews coming in from the side, oh, that's all the ones in there. So yeah, really good for, for waders to breed in there, uh, to feed in there around the margins of the wetlands as well. So the next major habitat and one of the most important for the main thing that we'll be talking about later today, is the open water and margins. So there are large expanses of open water there. Um, and along with that come the birds that are associated with it. So we've got things like oyster catcher in there. Um, and we have otters coming at the bottom, shovelers there, lapwings. And as I said, in the bottom left there is a, a still image from one of, one of our camera traps that we've had out on the reserve since we started the beaver project or before we started the beaver project. And what we find through that is that we have um, regular sightings of otters there and we think they're there a lot of the time. So they seem to be seen on the Trent and on the reserve there because the Trent is just a couple hundred metres away across the field. And we think the otters are then coming up the brook along the side of um, along the side of the reserve and then using the reserve and going back and forth to the Trent. Um, <clears throat> so those are the major habitats we've got on the reserve. Um, and quite important question is why do we want to introduce beavers to that reserve? It's good for wildlife. What's the point in us introducing beavers there? Um, and one of the major parts of that is that to keep that reserve as it is takes an awful lot of work. Um, so for the last 15 to 20 years uh, plus that we've been managing it, um, we've been going in there most years, if not every year until the pandemic um, with loads of volunteers, and loads of people with loppers and bosaws. Some of you guys may have been out on work parties doing this kind of thing before on different nature reserves. And we go into the reed beds and we chop out lots of the willow that likes to grow in there. Um, there's nothing inherently wrong with willow and there's nothing inherently wrong with wet woodland that would form eventually. But what would happen naturally is basically the 
reed beds would start to scrub up with willow. And then over time, that would become a wet woodland and then a dry woodland. And then it, the, the final community across most of the UK is sort of a, an oak woodland, which would take an awful long time to get there. But um, these earlier stages of scrubbing up into willow and willow car um, can happen quite quickly, really. Um, <clears throat> so nothing wrong with any of those habitats. But as I said, the reed bed that we've got at Willington is one of the biggest areas in uh, the Trent Valley area. And it's also quite a rare habitat as well. Our wetlands in general, as you might know, uh, we've lost an, uh, we've lost the vast majority of our woodland over the last uh, wetland over the last couple of hundred years for drainage, for farming, and things like that. Um, so it's really important that we keep hold of the bits that we've got for the species that do need that. Um, it would be nice to have more woodland, but in our from our point of view, not at the expense of the wetland habitat that is also really important. So that's why we go in there every year with loppers and bowsaws and lots of volunteers and clear that out. Um, <clears throat> The problem with that is that it's very labour intensive. Um, it takes people travelling from all over the place, so it creates carbon, which is a bit environmentally unfriendly as well. And it's just very, as I said, labour intensive and has to be done every year. So it's really quite hard to keep on top of that. And what can happen if you miss a year, as we did the first year of the pandemic, is the willow shoots up really, really quickly and starts to um, encroach quite substantially into that reed bed habitat. So the idea of bringing beavers in is to see if we could do this same kind of work in a more natural way because what we're doing by going in there and doing that is basically recreating these natural processes anyway so the natural processes of grazing from um bigger grazers but also uh beavers would be in there clearing out some of that willow so we've been trying to copy that and what we thought was well why don't we try and bring beavers back in and have a more natural approach to it so a little bit about the the history of beavers in the uk so another question people might have is, well, why would we want to bring beavers back into the UK if they've already gone extinct? Um, surely they must have gone extinct for a reason. Um, so beavers are native to the UK. This is the Eurasian beaver. Uh, there are, there's, no, there's two species of beaver, one in North America as well. Um, we have the Eurasian beaver, which is native to, as, you, as the name suggests, most of Eurasia. Um, it went extinct in the UK in the 1600s, and by the turn of the 20th century, there are only 1,200 beavers left in the whole of Eurasia. So very small pockets um, across the whole of those two continents. And from Derbyshire, we think they were lost about 800 years ago. <clears throat> um, we know that beavers were in the UK uh, because of different types of evidence. So this is a map of different places where beavers and evidence of beavers has been found in the UK um, during excavations and things like that. That could be bones or fossils or um, other evidence of beaver activity. Um, <clears throat> so each of these black dots is a location where beaver activity has been found. From the map, it might look like there were more beavers over in East Anglia here and across this band across the south there. Um, those are actually more due to the fact that there was lots of digging done in that area um, for peat and things like that and to open up the um, the broads and then this is the course of a motorway so it's more of a um, it more shows where a lot of digging has been done rather than potentially the density of beaver populations in these areas but what this map does show is that beavers were widespread and relatively common across the whole of the UK. Um, another way that we know that beavers were around and where they were around is by uh, historical place names. So like Beaverton Farm here or Beavers Hill, um, these Old English and those kind of names are evidence of where beavers might have been found. And that's been used in other conservation um, projects as well. So at the moment, there is a project that's hoping to eventually reintroduce eagles into Wales. They've done a similar thing where they've mapped the... Um, the ranges of the two different eagle species by looking at names in Welsh and English and um, all the languages as well. Um, <clears throat> so that's another way that we know that beavers were all over the country. This picture here shows um, <clears throat> what was found. So basically the, the bank there that this fella is holding the stick down was that was eroded away uh, during some floods. So this shows this in the middle what we think is uh, an old beaver burrow. Um, unfortunately, there was another flood soon after that then washed this away as well before it could be studied more seriously. But there's 
things like that that also show that beavers were around on a lot of our rivers built into the banks and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so if we know they were around, um, why did they go extinct? That's the important question, because if there's a, an ecological reason why they went extinct, it might seem a bit pointless to bring them back and risk them just going extinct again. Um, in the case of beavers, it was not a natural reason why they went extinct. It was humans. Um, and that is that. So there was no valid reason for them to go extinct. And there is no reason to not bring them back because of that. It was just because we went and killed them all, basically. Um, so one of the there, there was lots of reasons why we went and killed them all. This is one example um, <clears throat> where this picture here shows these angry looking beavers out on the logs around. And what the text on the side here shows um, is some um, not entirely accurate. It's a not entirely accurate passage describing beavers. So it's talking about, um, I'll just move that up there because I'm not sure if you can see that. Um, what it shows or what it's saying is that the beavers, uh, they have eaten all the fish. Um, then when the fishes have run out, they've left the water and they've gone up and down the land, making an insatiable slaughter of the young lambs until their paunches be replenished. And when they fill themselves full of fresh, then they go back to the water whence they came. Um, as we now know, and I expect most of you know, beavers are vegetarian. Um, so <laughs> this is not the most accurate of passages um, and beavers definitely weren't going around up onto land making an insatiable slaughter of all the lambs. Um, but these kind of things that people thought contributed to the reason why beavers were killed. Um, but more importantly, they had a lot of practical uses as well. So <clears throat> this image on the left shows all lots of the different uses that beavers had. Um, so they were used for all sorts of different things. So they were eaten is one of the major ones. So they had meat, uh, the tail could be eaten, the feet could be eaten, normal meat. Um, they also used the tails to make pouches and obviously beaver tails and beaver uh, things like that were used in North America a lot as well. Um, one of the major ones um, was the pelts. So the image on the right here shows the different areas, uh, the different surface area of different pelts. So you can see the, the size of the beaver pelts in comparison to the pine martins and, and ermines on the, on the right there. Um, and beaver pelts in North America were a major, major industry at one point. Again, it's different species, but very similar pelts. Um, so that was one of the major reasons why beavers went extinct. <clears throat> and the other major one is this at the bottom there, the castoreum. So these are images of different uses of castoreum. So I don't know if any of you have heard of castoreum, I expect some of you have, but it's basically a secretion from um, the castor gland that the beavers have. And that's basically distilled, distilled to make this castoreum. And that's then used in things like foods. It was used in medicines. Um, it was just eaten as it was. It's now used in perfumes and in sweets and other medicines and ice creams and all sorts of different foods. And it still is to this day as well. Um, lots of North American beavers are killed for their castor. Um, <clears throat> and there is some validity to some of these things as well, obviously, medically. Um, so what we know, or, so a lot of our medications come from natural sources and willows are um, have a compound in them that is used as a painkiller. So it was used that the willow bark was sort of chewed for a painkiller and that's now used in modern day medications. And what we know is that the castoreum, because they eat so much willow, um, kind of has some of that painkiller effect in it as well. So it's used for medicines and things like that as well. Um, it is now illegal to hunt beavers. So most of the castoreum comes from the US and Canada now. Um, important to note is that this can't be harvested from live beavers. So to get this, then you need to kill the beaver to, to collect it. Um, <clears throat> the thing that beavers are using it for, which is quite important for them, is they use it as a territorial marking. So it's quite strong smelling and they'll make little mounds, little scent mounds, and they use it to mark the edges of their territories, which is also then used for uh, trapping them, because if they smell a different beaver's caster, then they'll go and investigate. <clears throat> so those are the reasons why we've lost the beavers, as I said, not due, due to natural reasons. Um, so some more, so on a, on a broad level, what do beavers do and why are they useful? Um, so beavers are what's known as a keystone species. That means they are really important for lots of other species, basically. 
So they are a keystone in the sort of ecological building. Um, so they're ec what's known as ecosystem engineers. So most wildlife, most species will fit into a niche that suits them. Um, beavers aren't so simple as that. What they do is they go and create the habitat that they want to, to live in. So they change the environment around them to suit their needs, which is why they engineer the, the land around them. So they do things like build dams, um, which then creates wetland behind them. They can dig um, channels because they don't like to be far out of water. What they'll do is dig a channel from a water course to a nice tasty looking tree so that they're never too far from the water. When they fell that tree, they can jump back in the water to escape if they want to. Um, and then, yeah, by felling trees and things like that as well, they're also changing habitat around them. <clears throat> the other thing that beavers are known as um, in ecological terms is an umbrella species. So by protecting beavers and their habitats, what we then do is protect the, the wetland habitat that they create and that they live in. And that then, as a consequence, protects all the other wildlife that lives there. So it's really useful. They, other examples of that will be, say, tigers. By protecting the tigers' habitats, you're protecting the huge areas of habitats for other species that use that. Um, beavers can be thought of, as a, thought of in a similar way. So by protecting the beavers and the habitat they need, you can protect the wetland habitat for lots of other species. <clears throat> so a little bit more specifically, um, beavers are vegetarians. So they eat mostly the bark of trees, at least in the winter. Um, so they fell trees and strip the bark for sugars. In the summer, they'll eat all sorts of different things, um, like the rhizomes of reeds and things like that, um, other things with sugars in them. So in the winter, they focus on the trees, but in the summer, they'll eat other things as well. Um, they also, as I said, they build dams. And the reason they do this is partly to create the habitat that they want behind the dams and also partly for safety as well, because what beavers like to do is dive down into the water to avoid predators. Um, there aren't many predators left in the or in the, at all in the UK that could take a beaver now, but that's a, an ingrained behaviour that they have. Um, so they like to create this deep water so that they've got somewhere to disappear down into if a predator turns up that that predator then can't follow them down into. <clears throat> and as I just said as well, they also dig channels to um, specific places they want to go so that they don't have to go too far from the water. And this leads to a sort of more diverse and um, a more... Um, mosaic wetland habitat. <clears throat> so what are the benefits that come with that? And why do we want, why do we want those things to happen? Um, so the dams that beavers build, um, as I said, they can leave, be they, they create a wetland habitat behind them. Um, what that does is it raises the water table and that helps alleviate extremes of both drought, which is same, makes a bit more sense. It's holding water back. The water's gonna be held back there longer in in dry spells, but it also, um, as we now know, alleviates the most extreme parts of floods. So what it does is it slows down the flow of water up in the higher end of the catchments, which just um, we're now recreating generally across, you know, in conservation movements across the UK. Um, you might have heard it called natural flood management, NFM. So people are now going in and putting leaky dams into streams up in the higher end of the catchment to try and slow down that water on the way down to the bigger rivers. So by um, slowing down the water up in the top end of the dove and holding that back there, it just means that the water doesn't all rush down to the Trent at once and bring up the level of the Trent quite so much. Um, it also then creates, it also, um, by slowing the water down and holding it there, what it does is allow the silt to drop out of the water. So it cleans the water as well. So rather than the water rushing along with the silt in it, it sits there for a while and the silt drops out and builds up on the bottom of the, of these pools. And then the water coming out of the, the other side of the dam is a lot cleaner. And then also, as I said, the habitats that are formed by these beavers are used by all sorts of different species. Um, so we go around managing wetlands and beavers will create them and create really nice mosaic habitats. Um, <clears throat> and they also hold back carbon within those habitats as well. Get down, get down. So this is um, a few images of some of the worst of the flooding over the last few years across all over the UK. Um, as we all know, I'm sure, it is becoming a bigger and more common problem across the UK now that we're getting these really, really massive floods. Um, so we, I can't remember what year it was now. Was it 2018 or 19? We had the really big ones on the Derwent um, through Matlock and that area. And it, yeah, what were one in 100 year floods are now happening once every 10 years and um, becoming more and more extreme. And we basically aren't, our currently our infrastructure is mostly not designed to be able to deal with this. 
Um, <clears throat> so what we mostly do on, and have done is build big solid walls to hold all that water in place and stop it, you know, flooding our towns. And what all that does is push it straight downstream to the next town instead. Um, so something like beavers and other natural flood management um, approaches holding back that water higher up the catchment just reduces the likelihood of this happening. Um, now, I'm not claiming that these beavers in Wellington would be able to stop a massive flood on the Trent. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is, you know, a big population of beavers higher up in these catchments would help a little bit towards that. Um, by the time the water gets to the Trent, there's not an awful lot that our four beavers could do about it, even if they were out on the Trent. Um, but it's large numbers of beavers across these um, higher catchment areas could really help reduce these kind of images. Um, so as I said, one of the major ways that they do all this is by creating these oh, is by creating these dams. It's gone back again. And as I said, what they do is they build the dam to increase the water table and the water level, and then the entrance to these um, dams is under the, keeps flicking forward. Sorry, is underneath the water there so that they can escape the predators and get into their um, dams without being uh, eaten by the predators. But what a lot of people expect when we talk about beavers is images like this top left one here. Um, this is a dam created by North American beavers. Um, that isn't really what Eurasian beavers do. So North American beavers will be, build these huge dams across big rivers and create massive wetlands like this or massive um, pools like this. Eurasian beavers are much more like these bottom two images here. They create multiple small dams across uh, smaller streams and to the side of the big rivers rather than blocking off a whole huge river. So they aren't likely to cause a huge amount of water to be held up and flood just upstream of a on a massive river like that. And this is <clears throat> one of the ways that um, Eurasian beavers can help create these nice mosaic habitats. So those six images on the right um, show how the process works. So a lot of our streams in the UK at the moment are a lot like this one on the left, um, without the dams in it, but quite vertical sides or close to vertical sides, quite deep and not really connected to their floodplains. Um, <clears throat> and again, what that means is when we do get high rainfalls, the water rushes straight down it and disappears downstream. Um, but what we might want to do instead is allow areas like this one to hold a bit more water so that places like Derby aren't getting filled up with water. Um, so yeah, these six images on the right show how that works. And what the beavers do is they create dams in these, um, in these upland streams with quite vertical sides. And what that does is it kind of hold, holds back the water as you'd expect it to, raises the water table. Um, but over time, what will happen is the water, you know, if there's a big flood, it'll start to knock through some of this dam and it might raise around the sides and start to erode around it. And then that dam will over time kind of break down and become pretty much useless as a dam. Um, so the image on the top right shows that that started to happen. And what that then does is makes the water kind of start to spread out sideways and erode a wider channel. And on the sea there, what you can see is the beaver's next attempt at the dam. So again, a lot of people have this image of a really massive structure that's um, staying there and is a fixed structure. And that's not really how um, a lot of our beaver, uh, how beavers will do things a lot of the time. It's a much more dynamic system where they'll create a dam, which might last for a few years, and then it'll get slowly destroyed and the river will go round it and choose a different course. And then the rivers will, the beavers will abandon that dam and go and create a new one. So that's what's happened by sea is they've got this wider channel They've created new dams um, and that's made sort of a variety of depths of water behind there as well and different bits of flowing water. And then again, by D, what's happened is again, these, these newer dams have been destroyed by big flood events. And E, they've, the, the other thing that's happening is that there's silt being deposited on the bottom. So by E, what you've got is um, sediment being deposited on the bottom, which is raising the water level. And the water, they've created new dams again, which is then spreading the water sideways, sideways. And again, by F, what we've got is um, a, a, we've basically got a stream that is attached to its floodplain rather than what we have a lot of the time in the UK, which is ones that are very straight and not really attached. By F, we've got this nice big wetland with multiple channels, that's, um, a raised water table, and that is a nice mosaic habitat where the, the stream is part of its own floodplain which is really, really good for all sorts of other wildlife that like those habitats. <clears throat> um, he, these are a couple of examples of some of the benefits that I said um, a few minutes ago. So 
this top one here um, shows the flow of water along um, in and out of a beaver site. So shows the discharge of water. And what you can see is you've got this really high precipitation here, but there's a gradual buildup. Um, sorry, that's the, the above beaver um, flow rate and it really peaks and then goes back down quite quickly. And then below the beaver dam, what you can see is this much more gradual curve which um, shows the beaver slowing down that flow of water. And then if you've got a gradual curve in multiple places on upstream, then that will then slow the water going downstream. And the other benefit, or one of the other benefits, as I said, this image on the bottom left shows um, water from above and below a dam. And this shows the amount of sediment in that water above and below a, a, a dam. And you can see you can see it in the picture, but um, there's a lot less sediment in that water below the dam, which is much better in terms of um, it, it holds back some of the the sediment that flows off our agricultural land and, and can cause problems in our rivers as well. <clears throat> and so wildlife terms then, which is what we're most interested in as a wildlife trust. Um, a lot of people are often worried that um, beavers are going to chop down trees and that's a bad thing because we want to keep hold of our trees, um, which often we do. Although um, I will say that a lot more of my time is spent chopping down trees than planting them. So a lot of the habitats that we need to try and keep hold of because they're rare and have unusual wildlife are things like grasslands and wetlands, which will, they're not the final community. Um, they, so we need to hold on to those ones that are earlier on um, by re removing scrub and things like that. So what beavers do is they will chop down trees, but those trees will naturally regenerate like, um, it's similar to how humans will coppice a tree. That's kind of a natural thing that the beavers are doing anyway. So it doesn't kill the trees, it just means they, uh, regenerate and send up lots of new shoots um, in later years and then they create dams with some of that and that woody debris that the beavers create is home to over 2,000 species of invertebrates which as we know are in the bottom of the food chain which everything else can eat afterwards and um, review studies of the impacts of beavers overall have shown a, a really big increase in biodiversity in areas with beavers in comparison to areas without beavers um, <clears throat> and I'll go into that a little bit more shortly as well. Um, about what we're doing with that and the other thing that for us is a big benefit is that they'll hopefully manage our nature reserve so by going on there and chopping at that willow that means that we don't need to go on there and spend days and days each year with 10 volunteers chopping down all these willows and um, so we've got a few images coming up here of some of the impacts that beavers can have this isn't our reserve but we've got a few from around the uk so scotland and england and other places um, <clears throat> so this river is coming in this way and going out the bottom there and the beavers are in this square, basically. And so what you can see is this river comes in, very little vegetation around the sides, relatively straight, and then it gets into the beaver enclosure. And what the beavers have done is they've slowed down the water, they've reconnected it to the land around it. They have um, <clears throat> increased the water table, which has then led to this change in vegetation. And you've got this water tolerant vegetation like the reed beds here. Um, by putting in these dams, you can. they also, cause the water to flow in different ways going around the dams and they can um that can join it up with historical channels and um uh increase the number of meanders and slow down the speed and create this much more valuable in terms of wildlife and um flooding uh river which has a lot more curves and it's multiple channels and braided streams like that um and then it's also holding back a lot of vegetation there from this bit downstream here. And um, we've got some more images here. So these are some examples of uh, trees that have been started being attacked by beavers. And you've got these, this might regenerate here. This one on the side here might even die if it's left like that, but what that will create is some nice standing deadwood as well. So it doesn't, it's not causing damage to these woodlands necessarily. These are things that we as um, people that manage uh, habitats might go in and try and do anyway. So that's almost like a natural version of ring bark in which we do for um, willow tits. And this might be a, you know, they might leave some standing deadwood behind, which is something we, is, we know is really important for invertebrates now. And these two images on the bottom right, it's not a before and after. And um, what this shows is the image on the right is actually quite a good stream in itself. Um, but this area here where my mouse is, is this bit here. So it's kind of a zoomed out in a further in section. Um, <clears throat> and what you can see is the difference between this habitat 
on the picture on the left and the habitat of the land around it. Um, so what we've got is a lot more trees. We've got multiple channels going through this area. There's my mouse. Multiple channels going through this area and creating a nice wetland here. And what this is going to be doing is holding back that vegetation and creating a much more natural wetland for the other wildlife. So <clears throat> this is a rough timeline, a lot very wordy, but I'll skip over, I'll, I'll skip through it quite quickly. A rough timeline of beavers in the UK. Um, so beavers went extinct in the 1600s in the UK. Um, we think it was about 800 years ago in Derbyshire. And then in 2001, beavers were found on the River Tay in Scotland for the first time in 400 years. And we don't know where they came from, but the government's response was basically, oh, we need to get rid of them. Um, so that's what they tried to do. But what they found basically was that um, was that a lot of the local people didn't necessarily want them to get rid of them. So in response to this happening, the Scottish Beaver Group was established and um, they basically were allowed by the government to establish a small population in that dale in Scotland to study the impacts of the beavers there. Um, then in 2011, um, a pair of juveniles were released into an enclosure, a small enclosure in uh, Devon. And a couple of years late after that, we don't know where they came from, these ones, but there was some wild beavers found on the River Otter in Devon. And the government had a very similar response to the Scottish government. And they said, um, we need to catch and remove them and get rid. And what the local people said was actually, no, they didn't want that. They wanted, they, they didn't necessarily want to get rid of the, the beavers and maybe they wanted to keep them. So in response to that, the government allowed the River Otter beaver trial. Um, a bit ironic really that it's on the River Otter, but um, so <clears throat> the Devon Wildlife Trust and multiple different organizations then ran the River Otter beaver trial. Um, this was an uncontained population of otters on this river. And um, basically by 2015, Natural England said the beavers would be allowed to remain there as long as they were healthy. And this was a big success and basically showed how, how beneficial beavers can be on our British rivers. Um, <clears throat> then by 2016, following the Scottish beaver study, the Scottish government proclaimed beavers a native species again, and that then led to them getting protected status there. Um, they're still not native in England, so obviously that line between England and Scotland is a really clear delineation of where beavers would naturally natively be. Um, but yeah, they're native in Scotland now. And then as a response to all these to these couple of studies showing how beneficial they could be, um, multiple different organisations, including multiple wildlife trusts, have now got projects to release them on nature reserves in, in enclosures. So in England, they still legally need to be um, enclosed in, in a fence, not released into the wild. So for example, in 2020, we had some in Cheshire, from Cheshire Wildlife Trust, um, Montgomeryshire Wildlife Trust did uh, release some in earlier in 2021. And then in September 2021, um, we got beavers back in Derbyshire for the first time in 800 years into our reserve at Willington. Um, so the first pair were brought down from Scotland on the River Tay, um, where they were going to be killed as part of a cull there. Um, and instead of that, they were trapped by the, um, by, I can't remember the name of the organisation off the top of my head now, but they were trapped instead of being shot and brought down to us at Derbyshire um, and released into our reserve, into our enclosure at, at Willington. Um, so it's now thought there's up to about 500 maybe in the country, mostly in enclosures. Um, in Scotland, there are a few hundred and already uh, there are obviously, as we know now, coals in Scotland to try and reduce these numbers. Um, as an example, to compare to Scotland where there are a few hundred, Germany and France both have, I think, 12 to 15,000 beavers um, in areas that are much more built up than the areas where they are in Scotland. So it just shows that they can be managed um, in a sustainable way and we don't need to go and start killing them instantly. Um, so unfortunately that is what happened in Scotland, but on the but plus side for us at least is that's led to us getting some down in Derbyshire. Um, so at the end of September, they were brought down in a van from Scotland in these cages, oops, in these cages, and we released um, the first two. So that was a male and female, as I said. They were basically found in ditches on farms in Scotland. And this picture here on the bottom left 
shows the female beaver of the first pair um, <clears throat> in sort of a, a long pond, a linear pond, almost like a big ditch. And we do wonder if she went to that one because it seemed a bit more familiar to what she was used to. Um, and then after they were released at the end of September, we saw almost nothing of them for a good few weeks. And we thought, uh oh, um, what's happened to these beavers and have they managed to escape somehow? Um, and they hadn't, but we finally found these signs here. Uh, these are beaver prints coming out of the water there, which when we all sided, uh, we all had a big sigh of relief that they were definitely still there. Um, so what we're going to be doing now is we have a five year project, basically, um, of studying what the beavers are going to be doing on our nature reserve at Willington. So we have um, five years of surveying for multiple different taxa of wildlife. So we've got different local organisations, so Derbyshire Ornithological Society, the Amphibian and Reptile Group, um, Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire Entomological Society, the Mammal Group, um, Bat Group, Butterfly Conservation, Dragonfly Society, as well as a few volunteers, or quite a few volunteers helping us out. And then we've got links with Nottingham Trent University and Derby University to help with all this as well. And one of the other major things we've got is camera traps and drones that are going to be doing, taking some images for us of the, of the site to see how the habitat changes as well. So we're looking at both the wildlife changes over time and seeing what the beavers uh, do for that, and also how the, the, the structure of the habitat changes. Um, this here is an image from one of our cameras at Willington. Um, <clears throat> so this was, we've now got, like I said, multiple camera traps up at the site, and we've got volunteers who are running these camera traps and putting them out in strategic locations and then collecting them in and, and then going through all this, um, the camera videos. And this is one of the a still image from that um, of a beaver enjoying some, I'm not sure what that, what tree that actually is just from that image. Um, <clears throat> but what you can see there is they like eating the leaves off them, but they'll also eat the bark off, strip the bark off there and eat them as well. And this is, these are a couple of images of the kind of things that the beavers and I are doing for us. So, um, <clears throat> as I said earlier, oops, as I said earlier, um, what we would do to manage our um, reed beds is go into the reed beds with loppers and bow saws and chop the willows down to almost ground level and coppice them. And this is the natural version of that. So this is what the beavers are doing to the willows in, our, in the reed beds at Willington. So they'll go in and they'll chew multiple stems and they might leave one or two, but they'll chew multiple stems and they'll do this across an area and just reduce the vigour of those willows so that they're not drying out the reed beds there. So they've basically gone in and done almost exactly what they, they, we were hoping they would do. Um, not necessarily in the areas that are most visible yet. But there are a few areas um, where they've already gone in and started doing this. And we're hoping that over time they'll do that right around the reserve and then keep the willow down in some of the major areas of rebed where we have to go in every year. Um, and the image on the right now just shows the, the teeth marks of the beaver, which I think are really interesting. You can see I kind of um, the, the shape. So the beavers will use their bottom teeth almost to scrape up across there and what they're doing there is that this this one has obviously been felled and then there's the um the teeth marks on this branch here and then this one on the floor that's from the beavers feeding on the layer underneath the bark there so that's them getting the sugars out of the bark and that's why they're felling these trees is to get the the food from it more than they're not so far they haven't really been making any dams or anything like that although we are now starting to see some behavior which suggests they might be making um a lodge not on a stream yet, but they might be starting to make a lodge. But most of the activity we've seen so far has been more like this on the screen at the moment where there's sticks left in piles, um, there's smaller willows that have been chewed up. And then we've also now started to see some bigger trees like this one being felled. Um, so you can see the size of that in terms of the, the teeth marks on that one compared to that one. Um, so I think that's about 10 centimetres across. Um, and yeah, like I said, I find it really interesting, the, the different teeth marks on there. And, it, you know, it looks hand whittled almost, doesn't it? But and you can see, yeah, this, the kind of size of tree that they'll start to fell. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the time they won't fell these bigger trees if they don't need to. If they've got plenty of food in the smaller willows, they'll probably focus on those because they're a little bit easier to get food out of for the same amount of chewing. Um, so they don't instantly go in generally and start felling all these massive trees. They might do that in some places. What we've seen so far is mostly they're focused on the smaller willows and they're starting to take some of these, some of these bigger ones now. Um, this image here shows, this is near where one of the, the second pair were released actually. Um, you can see on the bottom right is a, I think that might be a hazel that's been chewed up there. And then what the beavers have done is they start to store some of these chewed up 
if you can see that, um, some of these chewed up branches in the water there. Oops. And what they do that for is that's called caching. And they store, um, they'll, they'll chop down branches and store them in the water for later. So the cold and the wet of the water then store some of that food for later on. So they've got a store for over the autumn and winter. So that's what we're seeing there. Um, <clears throat> so we've been seeing um, activity all around the site now almost, right from near the gate to the opposite corner, all the way around. Um, and then what we are looking at is how we can kind of study this and, and get a more clear image of what the beavers are doing. So this here is called Beaver Map. And this is um, a website and an app that's been created for us by one of our volunteers or two of our volunteers who have spent loads and loads of time doing this for us. And it's this really amazing app where basically, as you can see on here, so um, they've divided up Willington. So this is the reserve here. They've divided up the site into squares. And then um, this square here, can you see my mouse on that one? Um, <clears throat> so this one is, this is a, a screenshot from the website. This isn't the website up just because it doesn't tend to work very well on Zoom, trying to get the websites up and show videos and things like that. So what I've done is I've got a few screenshots from it instead. Um, and on this one, I've clicked this square and what it shows me is a species list of, of species that have been seen in that area. Um, so in this square, we've had kingfisher, mutes, one snipe, lapwing, and the beavers themselves. Um, the beavers was cheating a little bit because they were released in this pond, so we saw them there straight away once they were released. Um, but um, yeah, so what, the, what our volunteers have done is created this website, and then you can click on any one of these squares and see which species have been seen there. And what we're planning to do with that is we'll be able to see over the five years sort of um, how the, what changes we might see in terms of which species are using different areas, um, why, then we can look at why they might be doing that. We'll be able to see where the beavers are. So we have now seen beaver activity around most of the reserve, like I said. So they've been in all the, these reed beds here. There's been a lot of activity in these kind of areas and then right around the edges of these bigger ponds and in these ponds as well. Um, they're using the brook. This brook is um, through the reserve. They are using this, but for the time being, because they have these big open water areas, they haven't started doing an awful lot on that brook yet. And it might be that they don't end up doing an awful lot in there either. Because they've got this open water habitat, they might not feel the need to dam that to create more of it. Um, because one of the major reasons they're, they're damming that habitat is to create that open water. If they don't need that, they might not do that. Um, so yeah, lots of activity all around the reserve, but this, this beaver map is then gonna be used to sort of um, keep track of where they are and what they're doing. Um, so this one is another part of beaver map there. So this is a screenshot that's been taken of one of the different functions of it. And what this one shows is, um, so we've, as I said, we've been doing drone flyovers and getting imagery from the drones. And the plan is to use that to compare and contrast and look for changes over time. So what this is showing is a reed bed in November, 2020 and June, 2020. And as you can see, there are willow trees within this reed bed scattered through it. And what we'll then hopefully be able to do is over time, we'll be able to look and see when they start to fell. Say if they fell this willow here, we'd be able to see that on this one. And you can slide that across and look back and forth at different time, times and that kind of thing, which is really, really cool. Um, and we do know now that, that um, you can see when these willows are taken down, you can see the differences. So we've had a, we've got a couple of places now where we can see the evidence of what the beavers have been doing. Um, so that's one of the other functions on there. And this is another one of the functions on there. So um, what the volunteers, Andrew and Helen, have done is they've been doing lots of the filming for us, most of the filming for us, and then developing this website. And um, they've done what's called the um, Willington Diaries. And this shows some of the different things that have been going on at the site over time. So we've got the, the release, um, both releases there. They've, did, they've got videos of the health screening. So if you want to go and look at some of these videos of what's been going on throughout the project, um, it's beavermap.org.uk. And then there's a menu up on the top left there and you can flick through the different functions on there and have a look at all these different things I've just been showing you. Um, and you can watch all the different videos that are on the Derbyshire Wildlife Trust YouTube. You can get to those through this website as well, which is really handy um, and see what's going on and what's been going on through the project. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so what next for beavers then in general? So that's, that's what we've been doing on our project. And as I said, we've been seeing lots of activity through the reserve. Um, it's still relatively early days for us. They've been there for, well, since September, so four months, five months almost now. Um, and 
we've already been seeing some of the things we were really hoping we would see, which is them, the bee was getting in there and chewing up those willows that are in, our, in the reed beds. Um, it's going to take a bit of time before we know what kind of impact they're having on the other wildlife. Um, but that is a project that we're doing. And like I said, we're working with other universities with that. Um, but for beavers in general, so across the country, um, there was a DEFRA consultation. I don't know if any of you were aware of this or, or contributed, but there was a consultation that ran until uh, November 2021, um, where DEFRA were basically looking at, um, looking for people's opinions on beavers and, and what would happen next and whether basically they'd be allowed to be called wild. Um, so we don't know the results of that yet, but we're keeping a really close eye on that because we are hopeful um, at Darwish Wildlife Trust and the wider wildlife trusts that beavers will be allowed to be called a native species again, which they are, um, or they, they were native. We, they're just not officially called native now. Um, so we're hoping that that will be the case again. And we're hoping that they will be allowed to live in the wild in, in um, England as well, because currently they're allowed to live in the wild in Scotland, but not in England or Wales. And each of those three, three countries um, has their own approach to that. Um, but this, so this, this consultation was just for England. We're hoping to see what, what um, DEFRA will come back with before too long. <clears throat> and for Willington, um, so the black uh, boundary there is the reserve. Oops, is the reserve. Um, we are hoping that at some point we might be able to get a visitor centre near there. Um, there's also all this land here is currently managed as a quarry. Um, but what we will be doing is having a path coming through Willington uh, along the edge of the nature reserve here and then going through what is currently quarry land. So this, this land will be um, restored to uh, with, a, with a conservation aim in mind. So there's some of it's already restored, some of it's still active. It's all still part of the active quarry, so there's no access there yet. But what we will be doing hopefully in the spring is having an official path through there that will then join back up to the canal and back to Wellington to make a nice circular walk. Um, we're hoping to do more work in terms of um, monitoring the water bowls and the other species there. Um, there is a bridge that's now gone in ready for this walk to be opened up in a, in a couple of months. Um, <clears throat> this is all, some of this is a lot further down the line, like visitor centres. Some of it is closer, like this, this route that's going to take in a bit more of the surrounding area. Um, and yeah, then hopefully we'll have this big contiguous area of good habitat between the Trent here, um, our nature reserve here, the land next door, right up to the dove there in the confluence of the two. And then some of our uh, Derbyshire Wildlife Trust marketing stuff. What next for you? If you're not a member already, some of you might be, some of you might not, um, but you can become a member and that will then donate to projects like the Beaver Project and um, Wild Peak Project, which is going on near, near you guys up in Buxton and around you guys there. Um, so that, that's all through becoming a member. So you can do that through the website and all those kind of things. Thank you for listening. And I'll stop sharing my screen there. Henry, thank you so much. That, I'm, I just found that really, really fascinating. And um, all the visuals as well about how the land use changes as the, as the beavers and, and the, um, how the dams sort of break down and then get built up again. And that was really fantastic. And, uh, and it's so good to hear that we've, we've got them in the county again after such a yes, long time. Yeah. Um, and also it's so frustrating to hear that, you know, Scotland has a different opinion to England and, and all the rest of that. But Yeah, as um, I said, quite funny, really, that there, there's a straight line, well, not quite a straight line, but a line drawn across the map where the species is somehow native on one side and not the other. But that's yeah, how it is at the moment, at least. Yeah, which is, which is a nonsense, isn't it? But um, anyway. Uh, um, ecologically uh, speaking, I, at least. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, so I'm sure um, people will have lots of questions for you. Um, so if you um, want to either um, use the reaction button, uh, button at the bottom of the screen to put a hand up so we can see who wants to ask a question, or if you just want to wave your arms around to attract attention, um, then uh, I'm sure Henry will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, so, um, and can you also remember to unmute yourself if you are going to ask a question as well, please? Um, so who would like to kick off with a question? Oh, hi. Hi, everybody. Sheila here. A couple of questions. Uh, number one, I, I'm just very um, interested in the fact that after Margaret Thatcher and the Tories uh, privatised um, the um, water authorities, I'm very concerned about sewage pollution getting into the watercourse 
where the beavers are and causing a lot of harm. Uh, it's an ongoing problem. It all seems as if the, it's more shareholders, uh, profits rather than wildlife. And we've still got a Tory government, so I'm very concerned about it, especially with the huge amount of new housing that's been built and more effluent going into the watercourses. So that's my first point, which is quite political, I know. Uh, the other one is I was late joining tonight uh, because I've been monitoring the badgers in Dobshire Wildlife Trust Reserves in uh, Deepdale and Hartington, and it would appear they've been wiped out during the lockdown and the call. So I'm really very, very concerned about that, which links into my concern about reports in Scotland that, bad, uh, that the beavers have been called up there. And rather than being trapped and shot, they've been moved down here. So I would hate to think, I think it's fantastic, don't get me wrong, that beavers are being reintroduced here, but I would hate to think that they're going to be reintroduced only in future years to be called um, and shot in the disgraceful way that the badgers have been. Okay, um, thank you, you Sheila. Can tell that I'm really angry about that. Yeah, thank you. Henry? Yes, um, so on the first point in terms of um, water quality and housing and all those kind of things, um, so as I said in the talk, one of the things that we know that beavers are really good at is cleaning water. Um, you would hope that they wouldn't have to do that for raw sewage. But as we know, there has been quite a lot more raw sewage than there should be released yeah. into our water courses recently. Um, but one thing for beavers is hopefully they can actually help with that or they, the, you know, on the small scale that we've got them at the moment, they, their dams could potentially help clean that. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of housing, um, the other thing that's so good about natural flood management is that it kind of um, can counteract some of that effect. So by the what will happen obviously with the new housing is all that hard um, infrastructure allows the water to flow off really quickly, unless they come up with some more intelligent designs, which often they don't seem to, unfortunately, with housing at the moment. Um, but that water that flows off really quickly, the beavers can kind of do the opposite of that and natural flood management approaches can do the opposite of that by um, holding the water and slowing it down and kind of doing, yeah, counteracting that really fast flow. Um, but um, I will say that Seven Trent have been really, really supportive of this project. And one of their major aims is to see how um, natural approaches can, can help to, to um, alleviate some of those things. So they've given us lots and lots of money towards the project. Um, and whenever we've had issues with the project and we've needed some help with it, we've gone to them and they've been really, really helpful. Um, so they've got a really good approach now of, of um, yeah, looking at how nature can, can help with that and using those ecosystem services to be services for humans and, and help with that side of things. Um, and in terms of the cull, or the, the cull in Scotland, as I said, so what, what um, DEFRA have done so far is a consultation to, to get everyone's views on things. Um, we don't know what approach could come from that. It could be that there are sort of limited numbers allowed to be released into the wild. It could be that they don't let them be wild at all, um, depending on what they decide from that consultation. Um, but one thing that would be probably really important as part of a, an approach where we would be allowed to release beavers would be solid planning beforehand um, to be able to mitigate any negative impacts beavers do have because they can have negative impacts so they can by holding back water in those specific areas they can cause localized flooding in the area where they have built their dam um, <clears throat> so that could be an issue if you were a farmer who had um, crops that were worth a lot of money in a corner of that field they don't as i said they don't really build big dams so they wouldn't be flooding big areas of fields but even if you're a farmer that's losing just a little corner of a field that could be the difference between whether you make a profit or a loss that year so that is a problem for that individual farmer. Um, but what we can do is we've got multiple approaches for moving beavers along from an area if we need to, or you can use something that's called a beaver deceiver. Um, someone came up with that name quite cleverly, and it's basically just putting a pipe through the dam. And what that does is lower the water level to stop the flooding on the area around it, which then you know reduces some of the positive impacts for wildlife and, and the wetland that it creates, but it just stops that negative impact on, for example, um, the corner of a farmer's field or something like that. And these are all things that can be done relatively simply 
but they just need um, funding and staff and people to, to be keeping an eye on it so that if a farmer had a problem with their field, they could turn around to Natural England or DEFRA and go, I'm having a problem. Can you come and do something about these beavers? And then someone could go out there and they could do one of those things, move the beavers along or put in a beaver deceiver or any of those approaches. Um, you know, there can be issues in terms of, for example, man-made dams or flood prevention schemes where they built a big earth bank because uh, beavers will burrow into things. So they might decide they want to burrow into one of them. The same approach is you could move the beavers along from there. And um, we've got mitigation for, for any of these because um, as I said, there can be problems caused by beavers. They're relatively small and com compared to the massive benefits they can have, but they're still problems. Um, but there are things we can do to mitigate for any of those things. It just takes a bit of planning beforehand. So I would hope, as I said, I don't know, but I would hope that um, as part of any approach to um, releasing beavers into the wild, that would be planned into it and we would have staff to do that. And I do know that Natural England have already been recruiting for Beaver, at least one member of beaver specific staff i've seen that as a, a job that went out um to be like the national um the national beaver person for england and what my what, what i would hope is that they would have a team of people that can go and respond to any issues that could be caused to kind of nip anything in the bud before it becomes a problem but so really we quickly ask then is is um, all the funding for this from Dobshire wildlife trust or do you get any contributions from DEFRA and Natural England and even the heaven forbid the National Farmers Union. I mean um, is it all is it all down to the uh, wildlife trust? Or do you get so for our project it, for for our project we've had funding from um, members and from fundraising we had loads of members of the public that con contributed lots of money which is really really nice um, and really because um, Basically, what we had to do was build a big fence around to keep the beavers in. Yeah. <clears throat> and that obviously cost quite a bit of money. Yeah. Um, and we had increasing costs as the project went on. And we did some fundraising and the public contributed massively to that. And then we had other funders, um, such as um, such as Seven Trent and quite a few others as well. Um, I wasn't involved in that side of the project, so I can't remember relative amounts of each of those funders. But we had... Um, yeah, we, we went and got funding from other organisations, which is what we do for a lot of our projects is we have external funders and they'll have a pot of money and they'll say you can apply for this and you go and apply for that. So that's how a lot of the project was funded. Um, okay. And that was done across multiple different organisations that did that for us. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, I think you had a, a question. Yeah, uh, well, uh, excuse me, what uh, sort of area do the, the beavers need? To, to be successful, yeah. and how, um, how many beavers would Willington support? So we don't have an exact number of what Willington would support, but basically, so the area that a, a beaver and a beaver family would need um, will vary depending on factors like what kind of food is around and all those kind of things. So it'll vary quite a bit. Um, what we know for bee, for Willington, so basically we had one of the, the national experts for beavers in England come out and, and have a walk around the site. And the assessment was that we could have quite a lot of beavers there. Um, so, as I said, there's been some projects where they had just a few hectares um, and had a, a pair or a family of beavers in there. We've got two pairs, um, which we're hoping will develop into two families over time. So our Natural England licence said we could have two families. Um, of, that would be up to 12 beavers, so six in each family. What we actually ended up having was basically... Um, we got whatever was trapped from Scotland and was appropriate. So we've got two pairs at the moment. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we were told that we could have an, a lot more than that, but that's the license we got to be conservative in terms of the area for each, each pair. Um, so there's some that were down to sort of three hectares for a pair of beavers and we've got 46 hectares. So substantially more area than they would need. Um, and we could in theory probably fit a lot more in there. But for the, for the time being, we've gone with just those two family groups or two pairs. Um, one potential, I mean, well, I wouldn't call it a downside necessarily, but in terms of what we are hoping to see from the beavers in terms of managing the habitats on our reserve, we might not see big changes in the habitats like we would if there was a higher density of beavers. Um, but it means that the beavers that are on site will have plenty of food and plenty of space. 
And as I said, we have already seen some some of the benefits that we were hoping for. So fingers crossed in the next few years, we'll carry on seeing that and they'll have the impacts we want across the reserve. But it might be that after five years, we can, we'll see that they've had an impact on this area of the, of the reserve, but not this one. So we'll go back in and we'll start doing that um, lopping and bow sawing in certain areas where the beavers aren't really using. But that will develop over time, basically. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, Liz? Uh, it's actually, Chris. Sorry, sorry, sorry. about the natural history. How many kits do we have in a year, and how long do they live? And <coughs> so, just one other thing. Because my image of beavers is very much based on North American ones in Canada. Presumably, ours don't hibernate and will be active all through the year, will they? They so on the second part, they're a lot less active through the winter. Um, so what they'll do is like you like saw that store of um, on the picture, the store of, of food, they'll do that and they'll be a lot less active during the winter. Um, it's similar to a lot of our mammals in that they don't truly hibernate, but they can. They are a lot less active if the weather's good enough. They might come out and do some things, but they are yeah less active in the winter than the summer. Um, <clears throat> in terms of numbers of kits, they tend to have maybe three a year um, around there, two to three a year. Um, and then they those kits will stay with them for two to three years and they'll help help raise the younger kits as well until the parents get fed up of them and kick them out because there's too many of them in the one area and then they'll go off and, and establish their own territories um so within the five years we could in theory start seeing that between the two different family groups um because they would go up to maybe six in a group at a time and then once they get much bigger than that the adults might then shove them off um so then we might see some of the kits wanting to go off and establish their own territories elsewhere within the reserve. Um, we also might not depend on what numbers of kits they have, but that's what I'm hoping we might get to towards the end of the project. Okay, uh, another question? Um, oh, Dave, uh, yeah. this is me, and, and then... Yeah. Um, th thanks, Henry, it's a really good talk. Uh, in terms of their engineering abilities, I wonder how much they can actually move larger trees or are they dependent on them into water and floating them or how, how much their actual decision making or skill they use. I think animals can be a lot more skilled than we know in that regard. Just when we have what we know about that. Um, so I didn't quite catch the last bit, sorry. What well, we know about the... I think animals can be a lot more skilled than we have given. Oh, I see, yes. So yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, in terms of the skill and in terms of felling trees, um, beavers can fell a tree in a specific direction that they want it to go, but like they'll chew it in certain ways and make it fall exactly where they want it to go. Um, and that then contributes to the first part of your question and that they then have to move at less distance because if they fell it towards where they want it to go, then they can just take it off in that direction. Um, they will tend to, as I said, build channels towards the trees um, so that they're not too far from the water, but then they can also float the trees along as well. So they, they'll kind of drag it along behind them. Um, but we've got videos of them dragging some of the smaller things along already, but they can move some pretty substantial trees um, and they can then move those to make lodges. As I said, we haven't really seen them making lodges yet, although we've, just in the last couple of weeks, we've started to see some behaviour which might be them starting to build lodges. Um, but yeah, I don't know what the maximum size of tree they could fell would be and, and drag, but by landing it in the water in the direction they want it to go, they can help themselves with that. With that, Like you said, they're a lot more skilled than we you know, it's quite difficult to go in with a chainsaw and fell a tree exactly where you want it to go. And it takes some training and practice to get where you want it to go. And beavers do that, no problem at all. Um, so, yeah, you're right. They are, they are much more skilled than potentially something might give them credit for. Thank you. And um, Pat, did you have a question? Yes, you were saying that beavers create carbon sinks, which suggests they can affect climate change by allowing carbon dioxide to be absorbed. What is the mechanism by which that happens? <clears throat> um, so it's basically by um, the build-up of the sediment that drops out and then by um, having uh, put in branches and things on the bottom of the water. Um, similar to what will happen naturally in wetlands, a lot of our wetlands are carbon sinks and they'll store the water there and they won't take in loads but they'll just kind of help hold a little bit of carbon and then over time that'll just save that from being released to the atmosphere. So because water is, there's not as much oxygen, um, similar to sort of like the bog mummies and stuff that you find in Ireland and peat bogs and things like that. It's a more anaerobic environment. And so by creating more wetland areas and by then storing some of the, the wood on the bottom of as well, they can store carbon that way. 
um, probably not on a scale that's going to be um, have a massive impact on climate change on their own, obviously, but as one small part of a bigger jigsaw, they can help that way. Yeah, thank you. Right. Thank you. And, uh, any other questions? Is there uh, any long term plans for introducing beavers into other parts of Derbyshire? I was thinking of Buxton. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, potentially areas up in the Peak District like that would um, show more of the benefits that are associated with beavers in terms of reducing flooding and that kind of thing. Because mm -hmm. um, I quite often get questions about how the beavers might help flooding in where they are in Willington, realistically, by by the time they're right next to the Trent like that, their impacts can be minimal. But by having them up in places like Buxton, um, they might start to have some of those impacts. There would need to be more than one or two pairs, but um, that's an option. So yeah, we are looking at, um, at where we might be able to do it in other places around the county. I don't know exactly where um, we're looking at the moment. We've got a few reserves we might be able to put them in. Um, one of the difficulties potentially with the Peak District is obviously it's quite steep in a lot of places and putting the fence in for the beavers at Willington was a very, very difficult job because it has to be a high fence that's buried in the ground and all these kind of things. And to do that on in really steep gullies like you might find in some of the cloughs up there would be difficult, um, but it might be doable as well. So, yeah, we are looking at other places where we could do them, but um, there are limitations in terms of, of having to keep them in enclosures for the time being, at least. Um, so, yeah, it is. there are vague plans, but not solid ones as of yet. But we're looking at doing that more in the next few years. Um, but also because DEFRA are potentially looking at whether they might be able to be wild as well. Um, it seems to me like it might be a good idea just to hold off and see what they say before we go building any more big fences that cost loads of money. Um, before we do that, it might be just worth holding our horses a little bit and seeing, um, and then take it, and then, you know, responding to what DEFRA decide basically. Thank you. Uh, Henry, in, in, in terms of the fencing, um, yeah. Given how much beavers chew and dig and burrow and all the rest of it, um, what happens if they escape from Wellington? So if they escape, which they shouldn't, I'll go, I'll go back onto the fencing and, and how we try and stop them escaping. If they do escape, then we've got um, protocols in place. And basically the idea will be that we then um, go out with some of those cages that you saw in that picture in the back of the van. We go out with those and we try and trap them again. Um, and then we try and bring them back to the reserve, do health checks and bring them back into the reserve, basically. Um, there is a slight possibility that they might escape and we could never catch them again, or they might die while they're out there. But the idea would be that we would trap them, um, give them some health checks and bring them back onto the reserve. Um, <clears throat> hopefully that won't happen. Um, so but that was one of the reasons why the project got delayed um, quite a lot was we were finding out more and more about different approaches to fencing beavers in. And what we've got is basically a really substantial fence that for large parts of it is six foot high with an overhang and is also buried into the ground um, with quite a small mesh. Uh, the idea being that then the beavers won't be able, because it does sometimes flood at Wellington, so the fence has got to be high enough that when it floods, it's still high enough above them. Um, the overhang is to stop the beavers climbing out because they can climb. And as you said, they do burrow as well. So it's got to be really, really um, intensively fenced in, um, which is then obviously caused us other issues because we don't want to be blocking other wildlife as well. So what we've had to do as well is come up with solutions or use solutions that have been come up with by beaver experts in the country to make sure that other wildlife can get through it. So for example, we have um, badger tunnels in there. Badgers are the major one that are difficult um, because they're also big, not quite as big as beavers, but they're also quite big um, and we've blocked them from burrowing out. Um, whereas things like otters can kind of climb over in places they're a little bit more agile. Um, so what we've done for the badgers is there's um, five meter long tunnels of plastic pipe. And what the beavers will do is walk around the outside of the fence, kind of patrolling the edge of it. And um, the, by putting the, the tunnels just sunk into the ground very slightly, badgers will walk, the beavers, if you then put a mound over it, will walk up and over the, the tunnel and not even realize it's there. Whereas the badgers will find it and use it. So it's almost like an elongated badger gate because what they've found in other places is that beavers will use badger gates. So we can't just put a normal badger gate in. Um, so this is a design that's been come up with by the beaver experts where you put it so that it comes out about four meters into the reserve and that way the beavers don't realize that the entrance is there. Um, so we've got those in place for the badgers. Um, they are still digging in places because badgers are known for wanting to walk exactly where they want to walk. 
but what we've been doing is just encouraging them into these tunnels by putting peanuts and things like that in there um like we use for the trap and when we um vaccinate them similar idea we bait those for the badgers to try and find those and use those so that they can get in and out of the reserve um and then other wildlife basically has ways to get in and out because there's places where it's low enough for an otter to climb or a fox to jump and things like that where it doesn't flood it's only four foot high so they can get out in places there so that's been quite a, that's been one of the major difficulties actually since since the fencing went up um one of the big stresses for me is obviously we don't want to be keep another wild trap another wildlife in there or out of there if they want to be coming in so yeah wow sounds fun <laughs> um is there one one final question or yes sorry it's me again then, Sheila. Yeah. <laughs> i'm very concerned actually about the whole cost of it i think it's great beavers badgers bats whatever i think it's fantastic that the more the more species we have in uh, our area or britain or everywhere in the world is for the best but this is such a cost intensive project with the fencing the monitoring of badges and stuff um it sound and then the possibility of building a visitor center i just feel quite anxious actually that so much of the wildlife trust resources has been diverted to this project commendable as it may be that from my experience and evidence seems to be that the resources have all been diverted from the other reserves, which in my opinion are in a parlous state of repair, down to the beaver project. And okay, so we get the wildlife trust is quite yeah. a small wildlife yeah. trust. And personally, I do wonder whether they've actually got enough resources to do this sort of project. Okay, so we yeah. can you answer that then? Yeah, yeah, that's a very fair point. Yeah, but the major the major thing with that is that actually well, the funding for this project isn't coming from internal DWT funds. So it comes from um, external funders, like I said. So um, we put in funding bids to Seven Trent and multiple other uh, funders as well. And they have funded basically the whole project. So there's little parts that will come from DWT, like some, some parts of staff time. Um, but the majority of the staff time and the majority of... Um, all, well, none of the fencing costs came from internal DWT funds other than the extra donations that were given by people when we did the uh, campaign. So it won't have diverted money away from other parts um, of the trust. Um, potentially attention, um, but that's one of the major things is that with it being such a big project, it's actually got a lot of attention on uh, a regional and national scale. So in terms of the attention that's been diverted from elsewhere, I think it's probably been worthwhile in that we've now brought lots of extra attention to DWT as a whole um, but in terms of money it won't have taken any money away from other um, areas because it's the other, the other benefit with um, a project like this which is seen as very popular is people want to fund that kind of thing as well and that is a, an important point when it comes to things like reserves it can often be a bit more difficult to to find funding for those because doing day-to-day -day things is often more difficult to find funding for because a lot of funders want something that's exciting um, or relevant to a specific cause that they work on. So for example, with Seven Trent, this, this links to their sort of cleaner water and natural um, approaches um, thing. So they were really interested in funding this one. Um, whereas there's not many funders out there that are really interested in, you know, normal repairs on a nature reserve day to day. Um, and that's kind of one of the major parts of my job. So it is a lot more difficult that, and that tends to then come a lot of the time um, where we can't find funding from elsewhere, then that comes from um, DWT core funds a lot of the time. But the bigger projects like this one will all be coming from um, pots of money that we've got in from elsewhere. So we've got staff that work, you know, spend time getting in that extra money. And it's similar for our other big projects like um, the Wild Peak one and that kind of things. Those those all come from big funding pots from external funders. Okay, Henry, thank you very much. Um, you've been really, really generous with your time and with, with your with the answers to your questions. So thank you. Um, so I wonder if we could, um, if everybody would like to unmute, if we could just give uh, Henry a round of applause for the talk. Um, and thank you very much, Henry. It's been really, really interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. And if 
if you come up with any other questions as well, then please feel free to email us as well and we can answer those um, if you think something tomorrow or next week or whatever. Right. Thank um, you very much, Henry. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Um, yeah. And can I thank just you. remind everybody, the next talk is in two weeks' time and it's another good news story. It's uh, Abundance, Nature and Recovery um, from the author Karen Lloyd. Um, so hope to see you then. So thank you very much and have a good rest of the weekend. Thank you, Henry. Thank you. All right, thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.